Well, hey guys, welcome to the Decision Point podcast. I'm your host, Mark Hopson, president of Decision Point. And hey, I hope you have had a Merry Christmas. Oh, what a joy to celebrate the birth of the Lord for us, stepping down from heaven into time uh, to become the savior of the world, uh, ultimately knowing that that would cost him his own life. I mean, there's so much that we have to give thanks for uh, this time of year. So I hope you've had a great Christmas already uh, and a great uh, time off from school, a great chance to catch your breath, spend time with family and get ready for a new year. It's the 2024 just around the corner from us. Hey, I wanted for today's episode, do something different. I'm taking some time off. I'm recording this in advance uh, to spend time with my family, but I wanted to give you guys a, an episode this week anyway. And so I thought what I'd do is I'd share a message with you that I got to share with our students at our student leader conference a year ago. Uh, and we're going to get into the book of John. And we're going to look at uh, some great teaching from Jesus in this that I think will be an encouragement to you. Uh, and in the episode, we actually talk about some fault, how the true gospel uh, is shown so clearly in this passage. And then also how that true gospel just contrasts with some false gospels of our day that I know you're, you're just swimming in the sea of these false gospels that are all around you, just like they're all around all of us. So I think this episode will be an encouragement to you. Uh, so check it out and we'll re rejoin you after the first of the year with a fresh episode with John Nielsen. going to be talking to us about a new book that he's got called uh, God's Great Story a daily uh, devotional for teens that's going to help to just as we're entering 2024 uh, and make sure that we're entering 2024 with a game plan to be people who are fed by God's word. And if you want to get even ad in advance uh, ready for that episode, you can go ahead and buy a copy of John's book. Uh, and we'll link to that in the show notes for this episode as well. So here you go. Uh, again, hope you had a Merry Christmas. Hope you have a happy new year and we'll see you next week. Well, last night we looked at this, this question of who is Jesus? Who do you say that I am? And we looked at this reality that it seems like even in today's you know, secular world here in America, lots of people still think relatively good thoughts about Jesus. We know we're here because we love Jesus. We think he's worth it all. Uh, but it's interesting, isn't it, how many non-Christians are still just captivated by Jesus. I hope you know that when you go to promote Jesus at your school, you have an unfair advantage. Jesus is the most compelling figure in all of human history, and a lot of people know that. You also have this unfair advantage where, you know, he's been given all authority and his Holy Spirit is at work on your behalf uh, to bring people to your gospel outreaches, to bring people to faith in Christ, and that's pretty neat. But, you know, okay, we talked about a couple of people that were smart and thought, you know, Jesus was pretty cool. Here's one more smart guy. Anybody ever heard of this guy? Yeah, apparently, yeah, apparently he was a smart guy, you know, a little while back, Albert Einstein, he, he knew something about something I'm told. Here's what he said. He said, as a child, I received instruction both in the Bible and in the Talmud. He said, I'm a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word, no myth is filled with such life. Isn't that neat to just know that Jesus is that captivating, that some of the smartest people and some of the most powerful people in the world can't help but be captivated by Jesus. Now, I wonder if we were to take a survey in this room this morning, or I wonder if this were to be an outreach at your school and you were to have brought 100, 200 people to come go through this series together with you, as I hope you'll do uh, this coming school year. And you were to do a survey of everybody on some basic questions, like a pop quiz, like a, you know, survey says type of thing, how the, re the responses would come on some questions. Now, we're not going to do a show of hands on this first one, because I think in this room we probably all know uh, the right answer to this one. But if you ask people, hey, would you say you're a pretty good person? I think most people are going to be tempted to say yes. I know, I know some of you are going to be like, well, no, I'm actually a really good person. Okay, but that's getting a little carried away. Okay, so that'd be maybe one question you could ask. Second question, if we were to survey people, would be, well, okay, I wonder, do you have this sense inside you that, you know, some things are right and some things are wrong and what the answers would be? Or if you were to keep going with the survey and you ask something a little bit, you know, deeper and said, okay, well, okay, I have that sense, but I often ignore it. <laughs> you know, how many hands would also still be, you know, up? 
And then just kind of, kind of bringing it home to Jesus, if you asked one last question and said, well, I believe that Jesus was a good moral teacher. I wonder how many people at your school or even in our secular world in 2022 in America would have to agree that, yeah, I actually believe that Jesus was a good moral teacher. It seems that everybody wants to say at least that about Jesus. So our story is set today. Yesterday we saw that the Bible teaches that Jesus is the son of God who made all things and calls us all to follow him. But today we're gonna meet a man named Nicodemus. And I know you've read your Bible, so you've read this before, but Nicodemus is an important religious leader of his day. A little context, Jesus had started doing miracles in that region, so that was pretty cool. He was gaining a following, but immediately Jesus was also gaining opposition. And there's a lot of controversy already dusting up about who is this man, Jesus, and Nicodemus went to find out. So let's pick it up in verse one, and we'll read the, we'll read the story together as we work through it. So verse one and two. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things, these signs that you do, unless God is with them. Well, that's pretty good. So let's look at this together and let's look at Nicodemus for just a minute. He was a Pharisee. What do we see about him? He was a Pharisee. That means he was a religious leader of the day. He was somebody you probably would have looked up to, uh, much like you might look up to your staff member here or your, your red team leader or your blue team leader. Like that's a good guy right there, right? He was also a ruler of the people. That meant he had power. He had prestige. He was an important person in the land. Another thing we see about Nicodemus is that he comes to Jesus at night. And that's kind of interesting, I think, because night's a pretty big theme in the Gospel of John. And it's unclear why is he coming at night? Is he, one option is maybe he's, he's trying to trap Jesus. Like he's going to come kind of secretly at night and he's going to ask Jesus a bunch of questions and get him to say some stuff, go on record uh, and incriminate himself. That might be it. I think it's more likely that Nicodemus is coming at night because he doesn't want people to know that he is going to Jesus to meet with them. Because you see, there's already a lot of his peers, his other fellow uh, Pharisees, people in that Pharisee club, uh, they already were not so fond of this man, Jesus. So likely Nicodemus is going to Jesus against the peer pressure forces of his day. Even old people face peer pressure apparently, right? Uh, Though we had a guest speaker at one of our events who was 80 and he said his parents lived to be 100. And he said, my parents said the best thing about living to be 100 is you face virtually no peer pressure at the end of your life. (laughs) So that's a thing, you know? But he's facing this dilemma. Uh, And, you know, he's this teacher of the law. And so, okay, what would it do for his reputation to be seen to be a student, you know, at the feet of this upstart man, Jesus of Nazareth? And he calls Jesus a good teacher. He says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. And that's true. I mean, Jesus did so many signs and they were so mighty that it's right. Nobody could do these signs unless God is with them. And he is right that Jesus is a good teacher. So what's Jesus' response here? You would think, you know, was he to say like, oh, I mean, oh, shucks, Nick. Thanks, man. I appreciate the compliment. I Thanks for the, the kind word on my message. That's really, that's really sweet of you. No, that's actually where today's story conflict begins. We said every good story has a conflict, and every story in the Bible, it starts out just like every story, and there's a conflict. And immediately, Jesus does not take that answer as anywhere near good enough. It's like Jesus is telling Nicodemus, if that's all that you think I am, a good moral teacher come from God, you've missed it entirely. And not only have you missed who I am entirely, you've missed who you are entirely. You see, because you're probably missing who I am as Jesus, because you're missing who you are in your own deepest need and your own biggest problem. And so let's look through that together. Jesus teaches two things about himself that show two of the most important truths about who he is, that at the same time reveal to us two of the most important truths about ourselves. So he says this, the first one is this, that Jesus says he came to bring new life. Let's look at it in verse three. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless Someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus has absolutely no idea what this means. In verse four, he asks this, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Like Nicodemus has no idea what he's talking about. And Jesus answered and he said, well, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so Jesus shows that the thing that we need most as people is actually to be born again. And he explains it. It's because well, whatever's born of flesh is flesh, and whatever's born of spirit is spirit. And everybody's like, oh, I got that now, right? That all makes sense why you have to be born again? Okay, well, let's unpack that. It's a very powerful answer. So, Because here's the deal. We're all born of flesh. And what does it mean to be born of flesh? Well, it means this, that you're like me. We all sin. We all do bad things. Uh, we, and we do them not just because we happen to have had a bad day, but because of who we are, we act according to our nature. Anybody here follow this guy named Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson is a, a pretty famous guy now. He's become pretty famous in the last couple of years. Uh, he's a, a clinical psychologist up in Canada, which is even more secular than America. And for decades, he taught psychology at the University of Toronto. So I think that would probably be like the equivalent of teaching at Berkeley today or Harvard today, probably a pretty prestigious school and also pretty secular, pretty godless school. And Jordan Peterson tells this, he says, you know, every year for years I've asked, and by the way, he's not a Christian, but he has some concept of sin. And Jordan Peterson says, yeah, every year I've asked my students this question, like, do you experience in any way, shape or form, whether it's just the sense, whether it's a voice or, or anything gnawing at you inside, that when you're about to go and do something, the sense tells you, no, don't do that. That's wrong. And he says, universally, year after year, all of my students say, yes. Isn't that amazing? Like, everybody has this sense of right and wrong. He says, so I ask him that second question, much like we did in our pop quiz. Well, do you find you listen to that voice, or do you just go ahead and do the bad thing anyway? And what do people say? Well, yeah, I just go ahead and do the bad thing anyway. Like everybody admits that they have this sense of right and wrong and that they don't even follow their own sense of right and wrong. They do bad things. I I like a a singer songwriter that, you know, everybody my age knows, hopefully a lot of people your age know too, John Foreman. He takes it one step deeper in a song that he wrote called This Is Your Life. So it's not just that we do bad things, but he starts to get at who you are as a person. And it's a simple line, but it's so profound. He says, this is your life. Are you who you want to be? And it's a powerful line. It speaks to us as leaders, like Heather challenged us last night. I think it speaks powerfully to unsaved people to just ask the simple question. It's your life, man. Are are you actually who you want to be when you get up in the morning and you look at the mirror or you take time to look at the mirror of your own heart? Like, are you happy with what you see or do you have a sense that maybe you're not quite who you want to be? So here's what the Bible says about us all. It says that we have all sinned, that we have all uh, become corrupt. Psalm 55, uh, 53, one to two says this, that God looks down from heaven uh, on the children of man to see if anyone uh, who understands who seek after God, but what does he find? They've all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. And the Bible's pretty clear about this, that we do bad things because of who we are, and it's that our heart is corrupt. Jeremiah the prophet made it very clear that the heart is deceitful and wicked, and who can even understand it? I mean, I think you can experience this yourself if you're honest with yourself, even as a Christian, to say you look in your heart and it's like, It's bad, and I don't even understand why it is so bad. Like, we're just that broken. And the prophet Jeremiah is clear that your problem lies one step deeper, that your heart is that corrupt, and that you're completely powerless to change it. Jeremiah gets at this by some colorful metaphors. He says, so can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can this white guy change the color of his skin? No, that's that's how you are. Can the leopard change his spots? No, that's how the leopard is. So the Bible's clear. We all do bad things because our hearts are corrupt and we're powerless to change our corrupt hearts. We're in, in the Bible, you know, it goes one step deeper that we're like so bad that the only hope is for us to be born again. And it's a powerful hope, like as we've talked about the problem of, of what it means to be born of flesh is this is what you're like. This is who you are. This is what you do. But the Bible's clear that, when, man, when you're born of the Spirit, I mean, the hope that that brings is unbelievable. If we can go to that slide, uh, one more, I think I skipped ahead, so we'll skip on ahead. There we go. That we need to be made from the inside out. The prophet Ezekiel said this, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. He says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I'll, I'll 
remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you, remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. There we go. Thank you. I got it. I actually have to look at notes, right? And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, the, the new has come. I mean, what glorious hope we have in Christ if we're born of the spirit. And that's what Christ is offering. So, okay, you'd think, well, maybe Nicodemus is getting this by now, but he still doesn't. Picking it up back up in verse 9, he says, well, how can these things be? Like, he just does not get it. And it's interesting, as I was looking at this passage, like, Jesus is as surprised at Nicodemus not getting it as Nicodemus is at what Jesus is saying. I mean, Jesus is like, wait, you're the teacher of Israel and you don't know this? Like, how is it, Nicodemus, that you're here tonight as a Pharisee with all that you're supposed to know, and you have no idea what I'm talking about? I think Jesus probably expects that Nicodemus, though the words born again aren't in the Old Testament, that Nicodemus would have been familiar with passages like I just read for us this morning, and Nicodemus would have known there's no way, even as a good Jew in the first century, I'm going to have good standing with God by any of my external deeds, that he should have known these truths from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. I think it's probably also that Jesus would expect that if all of humans were actually honest with ourselves, that we would know there's no way that we could fix ourselves, right? That there's no way that we could possibly fix ourselves. And it's a hard word that Jesus brings, but I think it's so much better and so much more freeing than any other message out there in our world today. I mean, this is the message of the gospel, which of course bring, means good news. And I think there's, you know, if we look at what's going on in our world, there's a lot of other competing gospels out there that are trying to be, for our world, a message of good news. And I, th I believe, obviously, that what Jesus is offering is far better gospel than anything that this world will try to sell you. But let's look at a couple uh, options, and you decide for yourself which one you think is better news. Okay, you want to do that? Let's do a little comparative world religion survey now. We've got some scholars on. Get your academics hat on. We're going to do like a deep dive in like comparative religion. Okay, you ready? So the first go false gospel that we're going to look at is the gospel according to Disney. As conveyed, of course, through the prophet Elsa, right? And you guys know that, that gospel. What's the gospel according to Disney? Let it go or follow your heart. Cast off all restraints. Be yourself. You do you, right? Oh, isn't that good news? Just let it go. Uh, no, I, that's crazy, right? I mean, if you're honest with yourself, I mean, what if I don't trust my heart? What if I just happen to be self-aware enough to know that if I follow my heart, I'm going to get myself into trouble? What if I know that my heart wants things that aren't good for me? And what would our world look like, for goodness sakes, if all we did, all of us, all the time, is just let it go? What if we all just let go and followed any impulse we feel anytime because we want to be authentic. Would that be good news or would our world be in even more shambles than it is today? I, I think many of us wouldn't have survived middle school, certainly wouldn't have survived high school, uh, wouldn't have survived high school without <laughs> being injured a bunch of times or in prison if all of us just followed every impulse that we have. I love watching kids. There's something about as you grow up, you, hopefully as you grow up in the faith, you grow up in your sanctification, so you're putting away the deeds of the flesh. But I, I think there's also the skill of growing up of just kind of masking your sinfulness a little bit, and there's something to that. But kids don't have this. So I've got this wonderful niece who's now 13, but when she was two, it was really fascinating because Alethea was a verbal processor, and she had a little brother. And I'll never forget sitting, you know, in my brother-in-law's apartment watching Alethea, like age three, maybe with her little brother, age one. And she's just like, don't poke Malachi in the eye. Don't poke him in the eye. And you realize, oh, she's talking to herself. Like she's just like verbally processing her own temptation. I'm not going to do it. Don't poke him in the eye. And I started thinking, what would it be like if adults just walked around verbally processing our own temptations? Like don't rob that bank, earn, <laughs> earn an honest living. It's better, you know? So it's funny, but I mean, think about how deadly and demonic this gospel really is. Here's, listen to how the prophet Elsa preaches it. She says this. I think it's, I think it's first frozen chapter three. She says, the wind is howling. Oh, there's the theme of the wind. That's in our chapter. I didn't plan that. Uh, like this swirling storm inside. Couldn't keep it in. Heaven knows I've tried. Don't let them in. 
Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, don't let them know. Oh, but here it goes. The gospel according to Elsa. But now they know. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. I'm one with the wind and sky. Let it go. The perfect girl is gone. Here I stand in the light of day. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. Wow. If you guys start singing that, I guess I brought that on myself. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. No right, no wrong, no rules, no striving to be anyone better, no desire to improve, uh, just just no sense to be somebody you'd actually want to be proud of. Just let it all go. What a bleak picture she provides of that gospel. Anybody want to follow that gospel? I don't, but I think so many of your peers are trapped in it. And I think maybe some of us have more of that inside us today where this, this cult of authenticity has trumped, even in Christian circles, the Christian virtue of integrity that says, no, I'm not going to just settle for who I am naturally. I'm going to live an authentic life by trying to be a person of integrity to be who God wants me to be. Okay, well, that's one gospel. A second gospel is the gospel according to, wait, Whole Foods? That doesn't make any sense. What is that all about? Well, okay, let's not pick on Whole Foods. They sell good food. Okay, but work with me. It's a metaphor, okay, Team Yellow? It's a metaphor. So, okay, I mean, they, there's, there's something about our culture today that's like, I'm going to cleanse myself from the inside out. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. It might be by being a vegan. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. It might be by drinking soy lattes or maybe almond lattes or even better, Oat milk lattes. That'll do it. That'll do it. And you know, I'm going to go green. I'm going to reduce my carbon footprint. I'm going to drive a Prius. Okay. And that's going to be good. I'm going to cleanse myself and I'm going to be this whole foods person. Now that I've probably offended half the audience by picking on one of your, your favorites there. Don't worry. You can drink your oat milk lattes you can be a vegetarian, that's fine, and I own a Prius, okay? But there's something about our world that thinks like we can just cleanse ourselves if we go on some form of a detox uh, and we can just prove how good we are, we can clean ourselves. And of course, anybody that's living that gospel, I just ask the question, well, how is that working out for you? Have you done it? Have you fixed your heart? Are you telling me you wake up every morning and... There's no anger, there's no hatred, like you're good? You've, you've just cleaned yourself, like it's that easy? I, I think no, it's, that's, that's not how it works at all. Like if you've tried that, you know, that, no, it doesn't actually work that way. And let's look at the third and final gospel of our day and it's simply this, do better, okay? Can you do that for me, like all of you, like now? Just, just do better, like fix yourself, man. Like you're probably a closet racist and you don't know it. You, you, might be, you might be a homophobe. I know I'm getting real here. Like, you might be a xenophobe. And if there's anything else you could be a phobe of, you're probably that, and so you should stop it. You should just fix yourself. You need to do better. You need to educate yourself, right? Do better. Now, it's true, people are some of those things, and some people need to learn some things, right? And all of those things, if those are anybody, like, those are bad things. You shouldn't be those, Right? And there's something about this gospel that I think it gets actually right. We are, as people, far more broken than we ever want to admit. We're way more sinful than we could ever want to know. Like, who knows what could be true of my heart? We read Jeremiah, like, my heart is twisted and wicked in ways I can't even imagine. I could be guilty of all of those and more, says the Bible, right? But just do better? Like, just fix myself? Like, do the work? Educate? Like, that's going to solve it? I, I don't think so. To anybody that's living that gospel, you'd say, well, how, I mean, how's that working for you? Like, have you done better enough? And how do you know when you've done better enough? And what, but what about the problem of my heart that's causing me to need to do better? And like, what about the guilt that I've accrued for all the times when I haven't done better? Like, I, I think this is no gospel at all. And I think it's worth, bear with me if I've stepped on any toes in any of those, you know, fun examples or even real examples. But I think these are the gospels that people in our world today are trapped in. 
And I think what's worse is they might be trapped in all of them all at the same time and they don't even know it. And they're at cross purposes with one another, right? Let it go, but do better. Uh, but like be yourself, but like also whole foods and clean yourself and like be yourself, but do better. Like how in the world can you live up to that standard? And here's Jesus who offers something far better, far better than this false dichotomy that the prophet Elsa offers us. You don't have to settle for option one of just conceal and hide who you are or option two, just let it go. You have an option far better that you can step into the light and come to the God who made you broken, sinful, admit who you are and let him begin to recreate you from the inside out. And I think, that's, I think that's worth being excited about. So the second thing we wanna look at as we close this morning is that Jesus explains that he came to give his life for our sins. So as we're all dying of our sins and we deserve God's judgment. We need to know that the Bible's clear that the punishment for sin is death. And Jesus shows that. Let's look at John 13, verse 15. Uh, now, he says this, that no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus uses this example from the Old Testament. This is the second time in the book that now Moses comes up as a figure. And I think many of you know the story that back in the Old Testament, the people of Israel had rebelled against God. They did something just wicked. And God decided he was gonna send judgment probably both as a right judgment on their sins and also probably as a strange act of mercy to help them see the sinfulness of their ways and turn to him. And what did he instruct Moses to do? He told him to make this. So the punishment was that God is gonna send serpents among them, fiery serpents that if they bit you, you would die. I don't think I'd like that punishment very much. Snakes were not exactly besties. So that would be like bad punishment to me by a lot. Uh, but Moses offers this cure. He makes a bronze serpent and he lifts it high upon a pole. And God is clear, all you have to do, people, is look up to the bronze serpent and you'll be healed. And a lot of people do that and they were healed. But for some reason, the sinful heart of man made some people decide, nope, I'm not gonna look up. I'm gonna get bit by the snake. And even though the bronze serpent is right there and all I would have to do is lift my eyes and look up, I would rather just die. And they did. And that's the example that Jesus uses. And then he gives us the most, one of the most wonderful verses in the Bible that talks about who he is. And he says this, that, can we go back one? Uh, John three sixteen. he says that, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus is clear that this is who he is. He came to give his life for sinners. And Jesus is also clear, like last night we talked about Jesus is full of grace and he's also full of truth. He goes on in verse 17 and 18 to say this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe, well, he is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And Jesus was clear. And so even as his followers and as his witnesses, we need to be clear together as well. And so decision point is inviting students across America and around the world to choose to follow Jesus, to come and be born again. And if anybody were to be watching this message now or in the future, if you have never been born again, we'd invite you to trust Christ as your savior and look to Jesus for your salvation and ask him to be the Lord and savior of your life so that you too can be born again and recreated from the inside out. We challenge you, will you listen to Jesus about who he says he is? It's amazing that if we are willing to grant Jesus the status of good moral teacher, maybe we should listen to him about the most basic thing and that's who he says he is. I sat on a plane not long ago coming to or from San Francisco. I can't remember, met a woman from San Francisco and she, we had this question about who Jesus was. I was actually writing this message and sure enough, she was a teacher. And sure enough, she was a person who granted that Jesus was a good moral teacher, but no more. And I'm like, ma'am, how would that be if your student said, well, I believe that Mrs. So-and-so is a good teacher, but I don't believe a word she says even about who she is. Like, let's give Jesus the dignity to say he is a good moral teacher and let's listen to who he is, that he comes from God to offer salvation for our sins. And so let's turn to him and ask him for forgiveness. 
But as student leaders, we wanna take it one step further and challenge you with a few closing applications before Heather comes up and gives us the call to action of this morning. The first one is simply this, let's believe in our hearts and settle it in our minds as a matter of firm conviction that people must be born again. I think there's just so much uh, going on in our hearts and our minds, even right now as I'm teaching, that there's something about us that we don't want to accept this, this binary, this, this black and white that Jesus paints here. But if you've ever kind of known the way birth works, you've either been born or you haven't. And it's not really that complicated to know like whether you've been born or, or you haven't. And you either have or you haven't. And there's something so powerful about this metaphor that Jesus offers. And if you've noticed, he says truly, truly three times while he's teaching Nicodemus this. It's almost like Jesus knows there's something about Nicodemus' heart and even yours and mine that doesn't want to accept that the world could really be this simple. That all of our friends, all of our neighbors, all of our classmates could either be in the category of born again and saved or in the category of not born again and facing Christ's judgment. But Jesus is the one who's going to judge at the end of time. So let's just settle it in our heart that whatever he says is how we're going to accept to look at the people around us. And so as we look at people around us like that, let's have our second uh, commitment is that we're going to be people who will share the gospel so that people can hear and believe. I'll never forget as we got into this mission, we started talking to student after student. We would share them a booklet like you have in your student leader kit where the first verse is John 3, 16, and we'd start reading it to students almost apologetic. Like, hey, I'm gonna share the gospel with you now, and this booklet here has John 3, 16, and I know you know it, and I'm sorry in advance that I have to bore you with it. I mean, what a terrible way to witness. Don't ever witness that way. But I'll never forget one day, I was out probably with Ben and some others at a school in LA called Pioneer High School. And we were talking to students all afternoon. And for some reason that afternoon, we got all the village atheists. Like nobody wanted to talk. They were all agnostic. They were all antagonistic. But finally, we met a guy who actually wanted to talk about the Lord named Cody. He said, I'd love to talk about God. I've actually been going to church to learn about Jesus. We got into the booklet. I shared John 3, 16 with them. And I tried to set it up like, hey, John's this author in the New Testament. And then I read the verse to him. And he's like, hey, I just got one question for you. He's like, the New Testament is that like the Bible? And it just, it just struck me like a ton of bricks. Like here's a guy who actually wants to know about the Lord. He's actually going to church. He's not only never heard John 3, 16, he has no idea even the most basics of how the Bible's built. Why should that be a surprise? I don't know, but it was. I spent my teenage years overseas, so bear with me, right? We did, built this survey that semester and we surveyed over a thousand students in California up and down the state. And I know all of you like Georgians and Texans are like, yeah, those Californians are pagans. No wonder their results came back so bad. And it's true, they are. But what we found was that like half the students had never even heard John 3.16. And then we'd ask a follow-up question to those who said, yeah, I have heard John 3.16. And we'd say, well, has anybody ever taken the time to explain it to you? And half of the students who had said yes just a second ago now said, no, I've heard the verse, but nobody's ever taken the time to explain it to me. And we thought, we have got to do something. And that survey was probably 15 years ago. So I guarantee you, even Georgia has got to be as bad as California was then, if not worse. The world has only become more biblically illiterate. So let's share the gospel so that people can be saved. Final exhortation I have for us this morning is... Let's lift high the name of Jesus with confidence. Throughout John 3, we see that Nicodemus is puzzling over this message and we see that he doesn't get it. But as we trace him throughout the book of John, he shows up two more times, one in chapter seven. He's like, hey, let's not be so hasty to cast judgment here. Like maybe we should hear this guy out. Like you can tell he's processing it. And then in John chapter 19, after all of Jesus' disciples have fled the crucifixion scene and Jesus has now died, two men show up, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, and here's a statue from Michelangelo I got to see when I was in high school in, in Italy of Nicodemus showing up and actually bringing Jesus down from the cross and taking him to a tomb and burying him, John says, with 75 pounds of costly ointments. It seems that Nicodemus was born again. And here's the encouragement for you this morning. Who knows who could be born again and have their life transformed forever because of your witness this year. It's a powerful testimony Keegan shared. We'll hear more from it. I know we're uh, running short on time, but let me close by sharing. I found a pretty compelling testimony this week. Our world's dark. It's dark in so many ways. One of the ways it's dark is in, in the issue of abortion. And the issue is looming large in the headlines today, any day. Lord willing, Roe v. Wade 
might be overturned by our Supreme Court. That won't end abortion in America. We'll just kick it back to the states. And I think some of the people, the the pro-abortion radicals, I don't know if you know, but there have been 50 pregnancy centers across America since word leaked that Roe v. Wade was likely to be overruled. 50 abortion centers have been firebombed or deeply vandalized in the days since them. Shelly and I sent some money to one in Oregon that we just heard about. Like, you got firebombed for being a pro-life center. Like, at least we can do is send you like 50 bucks to help you rebuild and tell you to keep going, right? But we deeply want to see people that have been captured by this ideology or been part of it in any way, like be saved, right? And so I found this testimony of a woman named Kathy, and we'll just share it briefly. She said this, she said, when I began my medical residency, I believed that abortion on demand was simply a matter of women's rights, the rights to choose. I felt that a woman should have control over her body and not be forced to bear a child she didn't want. She after I got my medical license, I was able to get a job at a woman's clinic in Florida where I performed abortions. Although the procedure was unfortunate, I reasoned that abortion was the lesser of two evils since I was doing something to promote the well-being of women, and I love her honesty, she said, and I could make a lot more money than I could in the emergency room. And then she shares about a day, she said she, she had her first child, and she went on maternity leave, and then she went back to the clinic where she had performed countless abortions, and she said it was just it was just different. And she said she performed three abortions that day that were different and started to just gnaw at her that something was not right. She said in the first case, I discovered that I already performed three previous abortions on a girl scheduled that morning. So this would be her fourth. And when I protested to the clinic about doing another abortion on this young woman, I was told by the clinic staff that who was I to pass judgment on her and who was I to refuse to do the procedure? She says, I told them it was fine for them to say that, but I'm the one that has to go in there and perform that abortion. She said, the next situation involved a woman who, when asked by a friend if she wanted to see the fetal tissue before she had her abortion, the woman said this, no, I just want to kill it. And she said, even at that time, she's like, I wanted to just tell this mom, like, what did your baby ever do to you? But she goes and performs the abortion for this woman anyway. She said, the third case brought me to tears. The woman was a mother of four who felt like she couldn't support another child. She cried throughout the entire time at the clinic and still Kathy performed the abortion. But she said, through these three cases, I finally made the emotional connection between a fetus and a baby. And I recognized the innocent victim in all of this was the baby. And that was the end of my abortion career. And you say, praise God. I mean, being an advocate for life, to just help people make that shift, to go from being pro-abortion to pro-life, that's a cause worth being involved in, right? But we want to see it go one step deeper and see a person like Kathy go from abortionist to saved, right? And so she says this, but it wasn't until a Christian friend gave me an article comparing abortion to the Holocaust that I changed my opinion completely. My father had been part of a unit that helped liberate a concentration camp during World War II, So I grew up with these stories and pictures. I could never understand how the Nazi doctors could do what they did. And then she says, all of a sudden, I realized that I was no different from them. And she relays in her testimony how finally one day, after just being confronted graciously, but with truth from a friend, and how she finally had to realize that she was just like those Nazi doctors that she had read about. She said, I cried out to God for mercy and asked him to save me, and he did. And that's what we want to see, right? We want to hold high the hope of Jesus Christ so that unlikely converts like Kathy, like Nicodemus, and like who knows from our lives, like you and me, can experience the gospel of Jesus Christ that is better than anything by far that this world could ever offer. 